Perfect. Okay, so I'm Josh Triplett. I'm on Twitter as Josh underscore Triplett, and you can reach me by email, josh at joshtriplett.org. So if you have any questions, comments, random thoughts, or interest in WebAssembly, then feel free to reach out. So let me start with just a little bit of background on who I am and where I came from to be working on this. So I am a uh, huge fan of systems programming. I do a lot of work on operating systems and generally what's classified as plumbing in various ways. I like seeing what's underneath what I'm working on and I more often than not end up working on that layer too because I want to extend it and make it better. So uh, since I was a Linux user for many, many years and still am, then that originally led me to working on the Linux kernel. I did quite a bit of work on that for a number of years and then I started finding that I also really valued having a, uh, a healthy and non-toxic community, so I don't work on the Linux kernel anymore. Uh, and one thing led to another, and I found myself to one of the friendliest communities around and started working on Rust. And after contributing to that for a while, I ended up becoming a uh, member of the Rust organizations and helping to make the Rust language better. So I'm also one of the language team leads and a member of the cargo team to try to help make the language and packaging ecosystem better. So uh, with that background in mind, one of the things I've been the most excited about in recent memory is WebAssembly. I've been uh, interested in this because it combines system level thinking and system level programming, which is with a much higher level interface, it's more amenable to high level programming, high level programming languages, and the concept that just because you're doing systems programming doesn't mean everything has to be in C. So, uh, I'm excited about this for a wide variety of reasons. I want to use this as the standard way to do embedding, the standard way to do plug-in interfaces that can be written to in any language rather than just C, that it is language agnostic, it's safe, it's sandboxed. I'm excited about the possibility of shared nothing linking, of uh, libraries that are not all powerful within your address space, and just things like the uh, WebAssembly interface types present, uh, proposal which may make it possible to have a safe non-C ABI for languages like Rust and Python to talk to each other without going to a least common denominator. And then, because I'm more interested in the systems level side of things, I'm really interested in the WebAssembly system interface for effectively what is the syscall layer of WebAssembly? How can you do low level operations very easily? How can you do them portably? Work with files, work with memory, work with all sorts of other types that you normally expect to be able to operate on. And that's why I'm working with the Bytecode Alliance. So I'm uh, Intel's representative with the Bytecode Alliance. I'm doing a lot of work with the uh, Wasm time virtual machine for WebAssembly and having a lot of fun working on that. So again, I really enjoy working on the next layer down. So I don't just wanna know, well, how do I use all these interesting technologies? My thought is, well, how do you write new syscalls? When I worked on Linux, I dove down and figured out, okay, how can I work on the Linux kernel? How can I add new system calls, new drivers, new capabilities to the system? And so I wanna ask the same question of WebAssembly because I don't just wanna say, well, pay no attention to the magic behind the curtain, cool, th cool things are coming down the road. I also wanna say, here's how you can become a developer and help. So I wanna talk about how is it that you extend the WebAssembly system interface, and I'm gonna be using Wasm Time as an example for how to do that. So I do wanna emphasize one thing. This is not about how you embed Wasm Time and provide new functions. That's a really fun capability for which there are great examples and that is effectively link the library, provide some functions, run WebAssembly, and it can call those functions. That's not quite what this is. This is the mechanism for adding effectively new syscalls that are implemented at the host level that are not more than just a simple function. They are a standard function with types described by the WebAssembly interface types that you can then call from a variety of different modules and potentially get into standards work down the road. So I also wanna emphasize this is all under very active development. It may change in the future. This is more of as a getting started guide that will work today. It needs a lot more automation. Just because it's using WebAssembly interface types and WIDEX does not necessarily mean that the, uh, all the pieces that could be generated from WIDEX are currently being generated rather than handwritten. So some things need writing about five different times. And finally, for anybody familiar with Git, here be submodule dragons. 
So there are a number of repositories involved here that have submodules and submodules within submodules to go grab pieces of the standard tools that are in flux. So be cautious when navigating down the tree that you have checked out all the submodules that you're using the right version of them. Um, it's fairly well documented, just a fair warning because otherwise you might get a fair bit in and then say, oh wait, I didn't check out the submodules, that's why it doesn't build. Okay, so with all those disclaimers in mind, a little bit of background on WebAssembly system interface. So uh, WASI has this concept of phases. Uh, Pat talked a little bit about that in his talk as well. And the three major phases of WebAssembly that are documented are the ephemeral phase, the latest uh, version that nobody directly implements themselves, but more is used as the standards proposal that is still baking. That gets periodically snapshot into the snapshot version, and the latest snapshot is what people tend to work on. And then there are the archives in the old directory, which the snapshot becomes old when ephemeral becomes the new snapshot. So all of the standards proposals tend to start in ephemeral. That's where we're playing with interface types, that's where we're playing with new modularity, all sorts of things like that. But WebAssembly runtimes don't normally implement the ephemeral phase directly because it is still in flux and under discussion and similar. So it turns out that if you're just hacking something together and playing with a new syscall, it's easier to do that on the latest snapshot instead, and then you can always port it to ephemeral if you want to make it an official standards proposal, but why make your life difficult by starting by doing it in something that has no backing implementation in any major runtime yet? So. This is going to be using WebAssembly interface types. There's a wonderful introduction by uh, Lynn with all sorts of wonderful code cartoons that explains how and why WebAssembly interface types. And we'll be using the WITX uh, generator for that that is, again, a cross between WebAssembly interface types and some extensions to make it usable today. So with WITX, the path within Wasm time to the current preview snapshot that you can work with today is under the WASI common crate, which has a submodule for the all caps WASI repository, which is from the WebAssembly organization. And that has in its snapshot phase, the snapshot preview one WIDX file. So this path within WASM time gives the latest snapshot of the WebAssembly system interface. So what would you typically do if you're trying to hack at the kernel level and figure out, well, I wanna make sure I can make my code run? Well, step one, you'd probably modify the kernel and make it uh, print something on boot time or similar without interfacing with user space. And that's easy enough to do with Wasm time as well, just make sure you can actually compile the code. So going to step two of that, you would then wanna say, well, how do I make the simplest possible interface from user space to the kernel, you might add a new system call that does nothing but when called prints hello world to the kernel log or similar. So let's do something similar with WebAssembly interface types and Wasm time. So let's start by modifying WASI snapshot preview one and we'll add a new function to print a greeting. It's an interface function. Its name is print greeting. It's exported as a function. It does nothing and it returns an error no because hey, all good functions might potentially fail, even the ability to print air, hello world. So that's the specification for how that works. Now the next several things should really be auto-generated from that. They're not entirely, so I'm gonna walk through how to plumb this all the way through the stack. So in uh, WASI common, there is a common implementation of the system calls with the idea that any runtime could reasonably reuse this implementation if it doesn't have unusual requirements. And so there's a host calls directory that has all of the uh, calls that are implemented on the host side that need special privileges in order to be implemented so they're not written in WebAssembly, they're outside the sandbox. And this is where those calls are plumbed to. So there's a host calls macro in, host, in the uh, host calls directory that defines all of these functions and creates part of the plumbing for you. And so we're gonna define a new function there that is print greeting. It's a function defined in Rust and it returns a WASI error no T. Then we plumb that down to the implementation of the host calls. So the next layer down, host calls generates something that returns an error no. Host calls impl is what's actually called by what that macro generates, 
and it actually gets to use higher level types like a Rust result. So this says, well, if it's successful, it will return nothing. If it fails, it will return some kind of error type in Rust parlance. And so here we print hello world and we return success and we successfully ran. Then the last bit of plumbing here is that we need to uh, have the C layer syscall interface of this. This is definitely one that should be auto-generated. And this one is a C uh, signature function that is the equivalent of this that takes a raw pointer to the context of the virtual machine that returns an error no, and all it does is call the host calls level function. So there's about three levels of calls here that each system call gets plumbed through. It will call the syscall, which will call the host call, which will call the host call impl, and that can do the actual implementation. So um, there is also a um, no longer in use interface, a C version of this interface where you would also have to plumb this if you wanted to be able to support VMs written in C. That will likely be revived once this is auto-generated, but at the moment it's not necessarily required, so hence the fine print. And then there is just a list of all syscalls in a particular file, so this would be the equivalent of the Linux syscall table that says here's every call you can potentially make, and this is when you are instantiating the WASI module, it just says here's every function you support. Well, here's the print greeting function. So if we make that stack of changes, we now have a new function print greeting, which calls the syscall, which calls the host call, which calls the host call impl, which prints hello world. And then the Rust result gets turned back into an Erno and returned back up the stack, and then WASI will return an Erno. So we build this, and we now have a modified version of Wasm time that provides the module WASI snapshot preview one, which is slightly misnamed then at this point because it also includes this extra function we've hacked into it called print greeting, which is not part of the standard. So that's how you create an interpreter or uh, runtime that has this new modified function in it. How would we actually use this function? So this was a lot of manual plumbing and we could do the other end of it manually. We could actually write an you know, extern C function in Rust and compile that to WebAssembly or we could compile a C program down to WebAssembly that directly calls this. But we've been using WebAssembly interface types for a reason and this half is absolutely automatically generated today. So there's a Rust crate called WASI which provides bindings to the WASI snapshot preview API. So we could modify its WASI submodule to have our modified version that has the new call embedded in it and then rebuild it locally and we'd end up with a WASI module that has a print greeting function in it. Conveniently, I just added a crate to make this easier. There's now a crate called WASI ephemeral which is capable of building uh, the bindings to the ephemeral phase. We do this partly as a build test to make sure WIDEX can always process the ephemeral version of the standard. But conveniently, you can also set an environment variable at build time to say, well, I want to build against this arbitrary WITX file. I want to experiment with this interface and generate all of the Rust bindings for it. So I can go build the WASI ephemeral crate, point it to my modified WITX file, get an automatically generated interface, and just call that interface. So I can do that in two steps. I build a new Rust project. This is a completely stock, you know, cargo new uh, WASI test and add one dependent crate, the WASI ephemeral crate, go point it to the path to the uh, WASI crates WASI ephemeral. This is from the WASI repository. Uh, thing worth pointing out to avoid confusion, there is a repository in the WebAssembly organization named all caps WASI, which is where the standard lives and where the WIDEX files live. There is a uh, repository in the Bytecode Alliance called lowercase WASI, which is where the Rust WASI module that implements that standard lives. So if you are checking both of these out and attempting to fork them on GitHub, then beware that GitHub is case preserving but not case sensitive. So all sorts of fun and hijinks ensue. Be aware that those two repositories exist. Uh, part of the point of this talk is uh, these types of issues should come up once for one person and then hopefully nobody ever has to run into them again. So we create this uh, cargo dependency that says go build against WASI ephemeral. We create a main fun uh, function that does nothing but go call print greeting, uh, panic if it gives an error, which conveniently it won't, 
and uh, we haven't told WITX enough to make this function potentially safe, so it is a defined as an unsafe function from Rust's perspective. It's safe from a WebAssembly perspective. Now, to build this, we can use the Cargo WASI tool that uh, Alex developed. I think Alex is here tonight. But, uh, yes, he is, right there. Uh, so we can use Cargo WASI, so you can Cargo install Cargo WASI source, or if you don't mind using a pre-compiled binary, you can just Cargo install Cargo WASI. You can build this with Cargo, cargo WASI build in release mode, and we're just setting this variable to say, uh, here is where my WITX file that I just modified is, so that I can build against that. Then I run my modified WASM time, I give it the binary that I just constructed, and I get out my hello world by a fairly circuitous route. So we've now added a new, very, very simple system call to the WebAssembly system interface. This is almost enough information that you could go start hacking whatever new system call or POSIX compatibility or operating system interface or whatever other exciting thing you want to develop into the WASI standard and start proposing it and getting involved in standards and getting involved in extensions and all sorts of things. So the one additional detail that makes this more um, practical is that you also want to know, well, how do I pass and return data, or how do I uh, process something other than just a simple Erno? Well, WIDEX supports that as well. So let's give a slightly more complicated example of a system call. Let's create a function print rot13 that will take a string buffer it will rot 13 it and print the result, which means we can show that it's actually getting data in, modifying that data, and then writing that data or otherwise processing it. And you can kind of see the analogy here to anything that needs to take a data structure, do some interesting work with it, and then go on to do actual operations of what you told it to do. So we added one more thing. We added a param stir, which is a string. And a string is a WebAssembly interface types concept that gets translated under the hood to whatever your language thinks a string means. So in that case, that means that uh, C will think of that as a pointer and length, and Rust will think of that as a buffer that is a counted slice. So we'll plumb that through again. So we add our host calls, and this time around, we need access to the WebAssembly uh, memory object because you have to be able to read that string out of the linear memory of whatever uh, module handed you this string. Then you need the stir pointer, which is a uint pointer t, and you need the, str the string length, which is a size. And then again, we will return an error if there's any problem, which there won't be. Then our implementation is uh, really only complicated because of actually doing rot13. The Key detail here is just decode a slice of U8s. Here's the memory, here's the pointer and length. That will read out that slice and give you a safe Rust buffer. That can actually give an error if something goes horribly wrong with decoding a slice of U8s. So if you gave a weird length, if you pointed to memory that runs off the end of your memory, any number of things that could go wrong if you're trying to read the buffer that they passed in. And if you've ever done Operating system development, the analogy would be, what if you passed in a buffer to write that is pointing outside of your address space to memory you didn't actually map? So same kind of error checking here as something like copy from user in Linux or the equivalent in other OSs. Then we'll go get standard out, we'll loop over this buffer, we'll do the standard ROT13 translation and you know Rust match operations make that nice and convenient. We'll write it, that out character at a time. That might error out too if writing to standard out fails for some reason. If you, you know, point standard out to a full disk or similar in WASM time, then you would actually get an error of some kind. And then we'll say, okay, otherwise that seems to have been successful. So that's where we actually did the work. Same as last time, host calls impl is where the actual work goes of doing your new syscall. The rest is just plumbing it on through. So we plumb through the system call. And again, there's one additional bit of complexity here. We don't just pass things through. The uh, VM context is what actually gets passed around here. And from that VM context, we can extract a pointer to the linear memory and then pass that to the actual host call. So you can very much see how this could be generated from the interface types of just saying, well, 
I know I need the memory in order to process these objects, so let me make sure to extract the memory from the VM context and then pass it and check for any errors. All of this is very mechanical and rote. So now we add the new signature to the table full of system calls and we are done plumbing the system call through. So let's give it a shot. We'll uh, augment our source main.rs to not just print hello world, but also print rot13 of a string. We will compile that again, pointing to our newly modified version of the WEDEX file. We uh, run that through our modified wasm time, and we don't just get out hello world, we get our rot13 string. And because you always have to include some amount of yak shaving in a talk, I also went through a dictionary and found strings that were both palindromes of each other and rot13, just for entertainment value. So this is how you can add a new system call to wasm time. This is how you can extend the WebAssembly interface type definition to define how that looks. This is how you would get started on the process of saying, well, I need to provide this binding to my operating system feature. I want to get started on the standards track. I want to make a temporary extension that people can play with until it's on the standards track. This is what you need to go from being just a user of WebAssembly to being a developer of the infrastructure of WebAssembly. I'm very much hoping that uh, some of you may be interested in helping us do further development on WASM time, on the standards, on the interface types, and on the other components that are building what, as far as I'm concerned, is the infrastructure for the next generation of computing and systems programming. So a quick round of acknowledgments because this is using a lot of software and a lot of information by other people. So I particularly want to thank Dan Goman, who is uh, the uh, head of the Wasm Time and Crane Lift projects and doing a huge amount of really amazing work. Uh, Alex Crichton, who built Cargo Wasi, among huge number of other things in the WebAssembly world. Lynn Clark, who does a huge amount of documentation and other sorts of um, work to help make WebAssembly more understandable and accessible. Uh, Till, who is another member of the Bytecode Alliance and driving a huge amount of Rust stuff at Mozilla, and the rest of the members of the Bytecode Alliance. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them later on in the panel, if you find me later tonight, or just I'm happy to answer them via Twitter. Thank you very much. All right.